Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Over the past two videos, we've looked at two major hormones that are secreted and function in the human body, and those were growth hormone and the thyroid hormones. And we saw that these two hormones have mostly overlapping functions, although there are a few differences between them. We're now going to switch gears and talk about cortisol. And what we're going to see with cortisol is that there are some overlapping features between it and the thyroid hormones and growth hormone. However, cortisol has another major function and a major difference. And it's going to have to do with a stress response, that is a chronic stress response. Okay? Okay, so a few things about cortisol. Okay, cortisol is a glucocorticoid. It's a steroid hormone that is synthesized by the adrenal glands, specifically the adrenal cortex. And I have a separate video where we actually talk about the organization of the entire adrenal gland. And recall that in the dead center of the gland, we have the medulla. This is the part of it that releases catecholamines. So if we look at the exterior, we have the cortex, which is divided into three layers. And it's actually the middle of these three, which is termed the zona fasciculata of the cortex, which is actually what responds to a hormone called ACTH, and we get cortisol release in humans. Understand that in some mammals, like rats and other rodents, cortisol's function is replaced with corticosterone, but we're going to restrict our discussion to humans and cortisol, and we'll talk about how this works here in this video. All right, so a few things to talk about before we get into the functions of cortisol. Okay? We want to first understand how cortisol is actually released, but also we need to understand why it's released. Okay, So we're going to start out here in the hypothalamus. So here's our hypothalamus up here, and the hypothalamus is going to generate a hormone called CRH. This stands for corticotropin releasing hormone. Corticotropin releasing hormone is then allowed to move into this network of blood vessels here called the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system, which carries the CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone all the way down here to the anterior pituitary gland. And it's here that CRH stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release this hormone, it's a tropic hormone, called adrenocorticotropic hormone, which we, for obvious reasons, usually abbreviate ACTH. It's also worth mentioning that ACTH has another name. It is corticotropin. So hope they can spell that right. Corticotropin. And that's what actually gives CRH its name, corticotropin-releasing hormone. It stimulates the release of corticotropin, which is just typically called ACTH, an alternate name. So this ACTH then moves into the blood, the general circulation, then travels throughout the body. And its major target tissue is going to be the adrenal gland, specifically the adrenal cortex. When I get really specific, we can go back to this image and see that it's the zona fasciculata region of the adrenal cortex that we can see here responds to ACTH, and that triggers the release of cortisol into the blood. So we come back here, we see that when ACTH acts on the adrenal cortex, we get cortisol released into the blood. Again, some animals like rats and mice will use an alternate steroid hormone, an alternate glucocorticoid called corticosterone. But again, we're just going to talk about cortisol, but understand that it will have the same function in rats. Okay. So what are the functions of cortisol? Well, the functions of cortisol are going to have to do with the stress response. Okay, so the first part of our overall goal of cortisol is going to re resemble the goals we had for growth hormone and thyroid hormone, but there's one major difference. So the goal of cortisol is to provide adequate nutrients for ATP synthesis, just like we saw before. However, this is more focused during a stress response. Let's think about this for a second. If you're in a stress response, there's one tissue in particular that's going to need a constant supply of energy, and that's the brain. Because if you're in a stress response, theoretically, you're going to be trying to think how to get out of the stress response, right? And in order to think, your neurons have to have energy in your brain, and so therefore your brain needs nutrients. Now, one thing about the brain that's interesting, that's a little bit different than most other tissues, is the brain is going to 
actually rely pretty much solely on glucose, not fatty acids. It can run on other things, but when we're just comparing fatty acids to glucose, the brain is going to by far preferentially metabolize glucose. Okay? It's not really going to do anything with fatty acids. So therefore, if we're in a stress response, we want to make sure that there's still adequate blood glucose. However, we want all the other tissues skeletal muscle, the GI tract, the lungs, and everything else to really be metabolizing mostly fatty acids or amino acids, but mostly fatty acids, and then to spare that glucose for the brain. And typically you'll see this written as a glucose sparing effect uh, that in your textbook or your lecture. And that's what it means. Cortisol is going to make it to where the brain is what gets most of the glucose, and then the other tissues will start metabolizing other things. So let's see how that works. And what we're going to see is that it's going to start out almost the same as we saw for growth hormone and thyroid hormones. We're going to start with adipose tissue, and we're going to see that cortisol actually stimulates lipolysis in adipose tissue. So again, recall that adipose tissue is just fat tissue or body fat, and it stores fat in the form of triglycerides, and triglycerides is going to store fatty acids. So lipolysis is a process that breaks down those triglycerides into fatty acids, which then can enter the blood, and now you have free fatty acids floating in the blood that can then move to other tissues and be metabolized. So that gets us our fatty acid supply in the blood, we're going to see that in the case of the liver, it's going to be the same thing except for glucose. So the first thing that cortisol does for the liver is it stimulates gluconeogenesis. And again, recall, gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of new glucose or novel glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors like amino acids or uh, acetyl-CoA, things like that. And so the liver is going to generate that new glucose through this process and then dump that glucose into the blood. And so that's one mechanism by which the liver and cortisol increase blood glucose. The second way that cortisol does this on the liver is by stimulating glycogenolysis. And again, recall that the liver is one of the two major organs that store carbohydrates, glucose that is, in the form of glycogen. So by stimulating glycogenolysis, that's the breakdown of glycogen, the glycogen is broken down into individual glucose units, which then go into the blood. So cortisol is going to increase blood glucose via the liver by activating both gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Okay? So these two things collectively are going to increase the levels of fatty acids in the blood and glucose. And so again, that's kind of starting off the same way we saw in the case of growth hormone and thyroid hormone. Now, at this point is where the function of cortisol is going to diverge pretty significantly from growth hormone and thyroid hormone. And so we're going to look first at what cortisol does to extrahepatic tissues. And so these are going to be tissues like skeletal muscle, as shown right here. Okay? Now, remember, assuming that we've got cortisol elevated in the blood, that's going to indicate that we're in a stress response. And so if we're in a stress response, we want to make sure that there's enough glucose for the brain, okay? but also during a chronic stress response, we're not going to be synthesizing proteins. Okay? Uh, protein synthesis is going to be saved for when we're not in a stress response. Whenever we're in a stress response, we really have to allocate that ATP for vital things, whether it be fight or flight if it's an acute stress response, or you can even think of stress as a chronic stressor like marital stress, job stress, college exam stress, that's more chronic stress. And as I mentioned, your body will adjust and allocate that ATP for processes necessary for that. Protein synthesis is not as necessary for that. Okay, So we're not going to synthesize proteins. In fact, we're going to actually favor protein breakdown. So let's look at the effects that we see in extrahepatic tissues like skeletal muscle. Well, the most obvious one is going to be an increase in fat oxidation. Remember that the fatty acids were liberated via lipolysis from the adipose tissue. And so it's actually going to be these extrahepatic tissues other than the brain that are going to start preferentially using those fatty acids for fuel. And that's how they're going to be generating that ATP. Okay.
The other thing that happens is we see a decrease in glucose metabolism. So again, they're going to be shifting their metabolism toward fatty acids and away from glucose. Now, does that mean that they're going to be metabolizing zero glucose? No, they're still going to metabolize some, just not near as much. They're going to be getting their ATP from fat oxidation and also amino acid degradation. We can degrade any three of our major nutrients, that is glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. So it turns out that these extrahepatic tissues will also start to a greater extent metabolizing amino acids for energy. And the way that they're going to be able to do that is first of all by the inhibition of protein synthesis. So cortisol inhibits protein synthesis because Remember, protein synthesis requires a massive amount of ATP. And if we're going to need to allocate that ATP towards stress-related things, we don't want to be wasting it on the protein synthesis. So protein synthesis will drop and will start favoring protein degradation. Now, if we favor protein degradation, proteins degrade down to what? amino acids. So our levels of blood amino acids are going to increase and also those blood amino acids become available as I mentioned for other tissues to metabolize for energy. So the key with this part is extrahepatic tissues like skeletal muscle are going to start metabolizing fat, fatty acids that is, and amino acids with a preference for fatty acids and they're going to stop as much metabolizing glucose. Now, if these tissues are not metabolizing glucose, that glucose then is spared for the brain, right? Because remember, cortisol's effect on the liver was to elevate blood glucose. So if these extrahepatic tissues are not using that glucose, then that glucose is spared for the brain. And so overall, we have an increased glucose availability for the brain, and then the, there's going to be, of course, more glucose metabolized by the brain. Okay? So the overall goal of cortisol is really, I think, two things. One, it's for providing adequate nutrients for a stress response, but then that goes along with shifting the metabolism of all other tissues other than the brain, that is at most extrahepatic tissues, to metabolizing fatty acids and amino acids and not glucose, which spares that glucose for the brain. Because again, if we go back to thinking about a stress response, whatever that stress is, usually our brain is going to be trying to think of ways to get out of the stress. And if you have to think and contemplate, your brain has to use ATP. And just so you're aware, those neurons in the brain, the amount that you actually have to fire to think, that consumes a massive amount of ATP. The only other thing I want to mention about cortisol is, again, just like the other hormones, it's going to also exert a negative feedback on the corticotropin releasing hormone that's released here from the hypothalamus. Because if we have elevated cortisol levels, presumably we won't need any more. So if cortisol becomes elevated, it will feedback and inhibit corticotropin releasing hormone from being released by the hypothalamus. That will in turn decrease the amount of adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, which will then decrease the amount of cortisol that's released by the adrenal cortex. So negative feedback at play, just as we saw with growth hormone and thyroid hormones. So hopefully this gave you a good understanding of how cortisol functions. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.